Hello everyone and welcome to another skill capped guide. Throughout this guide, we will analyze some gameplay from Subrosa to show you all exactly how you can take your game to the next level. Subrosa is a professional Valorant player for the team TSM, and as many current Valorant pros, Subrosa was previously a professional Counter-Strike player. In the gameplay that we are going to break down, we will see Subrosa utilizing the agent Phoenix in ways that you might not expect. But don't worry though, almost every one of these tips is going to apply to all of you. Alright, now without any further ado, let's hop right into it. So we're going to start on round 8 of this game. So Bros and his team are on the attacking side of Haven. In the previous rounds, they were able to secure a nice 5-2 lead, but here is where it gets interesting. Now in this round, he starts with an operator watching Garage. His goal here is to get a pick so that his teammates can then take a bombsite easier. This seems to be a good plan up until he hears an ultimate orb being picked up. He quickly realizes that the enemies have pushed up C long and goes to contest them. Now normally peeking and fighting like that is a bit dangerous, but he communicates it with his team so that they're able to be there with him when he peeks. In the off chance that he does die, his teammates are there and able to trade the kill. Now him and his team have secured a few kills and they once again decide to go to B site. He uses a phoenix wall to block off the line of sight of any enemy on the left side of the bomb site. This is something that is so important when attacking B side on Haven. You need to wall off or smoke one side of the site. This way, you can focus on clearing the other side without being worried about being shot in the back. Now that his teammates are near, he can go ahead and start peeking angles. He played the first two peaks perfectly here. He first cleared the angle to his right, making sure he's safe from any enemies to his left. Then, once the right angle has been cleared, he then peeks the left side. However, it's on the third engagement that we see just how important that previous wall was as he's now pushed in. He's exposed to both the left and right angle, which gets him killed. Just remember, even if you're a top tier pro like Sabrosa, if you're pushing B site on Haven, you need to obstruct vision on either the left or right side so you can effectively clear the bomb site. Another important detail to pay attention to in this situation here is also the time. He had 52 seconds left on the clock when he died, meaning after he got the second kill, he could have chosen to back off and rotate, as it would have been likely the entire team would have rotated to defend B. Essentially, if you're getting picks on a site, don't feel like you have to continue to push. Those picks are likely forcing the enemy defenders to rotate to the site, so then you can rotate off and often get a plant down on a completely empty bomb site. In the end, his teammate is able to trade the kill again, showing just how important trade kills are in Valorant and win them the round, so let's hop in to round 9. Now, round 9 is a very fascinating round to say the least. This time Sabrosa is using a Phantom, and there's a very specific reason that he chose a Phantom instead of a Vandal here. Before the round starts, he decides he wants to push towards Garage. He chose the Phantom because of its close range capability. Not only does it shoot faster, it also has an easier recoil to control. Keep in mind, the Phantom is a one-shot headshot in close range, so it's pretty much better in every way to a Vandal in these short distances. Now, he's set to push out, and it seems like the same mid-play that the team has been doing all game. There is a reason why pros want to control mid on Haven as attack groups. By taking control of mid, you're on the center of the map, and this means that if you want to rotate, you can pick between any other bombsite while also being able to get there quite fast. Compare this to if you committed to controlling C long. Suddenly, you'll find if you want to rotate off, you only have one path you can go to, and getting to the other bomb sites will take a lot longer. However, this is where it gets tricky. His Viper and Sage take the bomb to A while he applies pressure here in Garage, even using his ult. This is a super common scenario to find yourself in. You look to pressure an important area of the map, only for your teammates to take the bomb into a completely different location. Here's the thing. That doesn't mean rotate and group with your teammates to rush the site as 5 players. Instead, notice how Sabrosa continues to put pressure on Garage, even using his ultimate. The first thing that this ultimate did was provide him and his team with information. They know that one of the enemies is in Garage, and that enemy is now going to be more focused on Garage Door. The second thing that this did was put down pressure. You see, if he and his team had pushed A site as 5, well, then the enemy defenders can freely rotate as fast as they can to stack the site to defend. Instead, by pressuring Garage, now the enemy team can't rotate to defend A, they have to be worried about the push in Garage as well. Sage eventually gets the plant down on A, and you'd think that Sabrosa has made a mistake because he's not grouped with his team, but again, he's now behind enemy lines, lurking and putting pressure on the enemy team. 
Often when lurking like this, you can catch the defenders rotating, like the enemy rays in this case, for free kills. He then begins flanking towards A site, trying to find the last remaining enemy, but ends up getting killed from an unexpected angle behind him. Here's the thing, by Sabrosa lurking, it prevented the Silva from pushing into A, and instead, he had to deal with Sabrosa's flank. So even though he ends up dying here, Silva has lost a ton of time and is now working against the clock, having to aggressively push in a site, making for an easy kill for his Sage. This round is a great example of how even if your team has taken the bomb elsewhere, you don't have to group with them, and instead can literally win rounds through pressuring other areas and lurking. So throughout the game, we've seen Sabrosa play super aggressive, running straight through the enemies. This can be a tactic that works, especially if you are a very mechanically skilled player. He continues to do this because it has been working all game. Well, let's just say the enemy team has picked up on his aggressive style by now. Over the course of the rounds, we see the defending team start to counter these aggressive plays better and better. Every round is getting down to the final seconds, and this could be a good indication to change up your playstyle. But Sabrosa decides to keep this fast-paced playstyle and pays for it. This is a very important thing to understand and learn. If the enemy team starts to pick up on what you're doing and is countering you well, you need to change something up. This will throw the other team off and allow you to stay in control of your games. Now, as his team commits to Garage, we see a critical issue. They have instantly committed to Garage without any knowledge of enemy positioning and are spread out. Committing to an area of the map without having any knowledge is a very dangerous strategy. You could be running into an absolute death trap and have no idea. Even though this tactic can be used sometimes, try to use your abilities to assist you in these dangerous situations. Now, this round probably seems super unorganized from an outside perspective as well, and that's because it is. Watching this, it's very apparent that Sabros and his team were not coordinated in taking Garage. They're spread out around the map, not using abilities, and basically just hoping for the best. Sabrosa and his team rush straight through Garage, hoping the enemies won't be able to kill them. The enemy team instantly picks up on what is going on and sets up a great counter, holding every exit and having one player flank. Having this flank is crucial to winning, especially on a map like Haven. Sending one of your defenders to push out and flank can often pick you up completely free rounds. Try this out yourself. Next time you have to rotate to another bomb site, try pushing out and flanking the enemy instead of rotating through your spawn. In the end, the A flank is able to grab two free kills and the defensive setup is just too strong to power through. We can learn many things from this round and the main idea that I want to focus on is how straight rushing an area with your team is something to use sparingly. If you all commit to one area, it makes it very easy for the defenders to stack the defense. Instead, look to attack areas from multiple angles. In the case of C site on Haven, try sending two people C long, two people garage, and maybe even one lurking mid to watch the flank. This way, once you get control of garage, you can execute into C site with your teammates long, overwhelming the defenders that are still there. Now, round 11 is actually very similar to the last one, the one factor that changes though is that they play it much slower and send a teammate to pressure C long. This is a crucial part of this round. If all five of the attackers push through garage here, they won't be able to fully clear sight when they get out. Having this viper go C long allows them to apply pressure to every part of C, making it much harder to defend. They then take control of garage by using a coordinated attack of utility. A breach stun goes out, a wall, a flash, and even another flash. Them using this utility is one of the main differences between this round and the last as well. This time it is obvious they aren't just running in hoping for the best. They coordinated some abilities and now they're in a much better spot than they were last round. This puts the defending team in an uncomfortable position because they're not just able to re-peak and gain control. This organization allows Sabrosa and the attackers to gain complete control of Garage and Seasight. After the plant, Sabrosa decides to keep control of Garage, which forces the opponents to handle a near impossible retake. Because he has so many teammates still alive, he's able to hold this C-Link area without having to worry too much about sight. Him being here does a lot of things actually. This not only puts him in a good position for kills, it also makes it so that his teammates can watch other areas such as C-Long and Garage. He makes a great play here by picking off Sova during the ultimate and then is able to secure the win for this round. Now, looking back on round 10 and 11, we noticed they were the same play. They wanted to gain garage control so they could plant C. The deciding factor between these rounds though, was not how good everyone aimed or what weapons they had, it was the strategy that they used. So if you're just rushing as five and losing rounds in your game, try taking it slower and looking to attack sites from multiple angles at once. 
Now, let's do some time traveling and head to the end of this game. We're going to go over some of the very last few rounds because there are some very key things to learn from these. We see the score is now 11 to 8 and Sabrosa is now on defense. Sabrosa has organized his team to play with one player on A, two on B, and one on C, with him playing Garage. This setup is somewhat risky because of the A bomb site. The A bomb site on Haven is infamous for how difficult it is to retake. And this is why many teams will put at least two players there. Sabrosa has instead opted to have a lot of mid presence in hopes that they won't commit A. Sabrosa starts the round by using his ultimate outside of Garage, then pushing in. Even small details such as where he started his ultimate are very important here. He uses it completely outside of Garage, that way he will be safe even when he ends up dying. We can extrapolate this, thinking to any agent. Many players will get caught with abilities out and die. You can fix this by doing little things like using cover before you use those abilities. Next up, he uses his phoenix wall to push out. This is another important detail to notice. This wall blocks off the enemy's line of sight and allows him to take one-on-one -on -one fights. He uses this wall to isolate one angle that he can then focus on. After he clears this angle, which happens to be grass, he's able to find a one-on-one -on -one opportunity at mid. Finding these one-on-ones are extremely important to being a successful Valorant player. If you run out while being exposed to multiple angles, you will almost certainly die. Also, during all this action, we noticed that the defending Reyna died on C site. This forced the B players to rotate to C and give up mid control. This is crucial to the next part of this round. Sabrosa decides to drop into Garage and help his teammates on C, but this leaves him exposed to Garage door. He didn't realize that his teammates had given up mid, so he played an immensely risky angle here. He would have easily survived here if he would have played just a slightly different position. For instance, he could have stayed in Garage Window and held the door, or even go towards CT and head to C site from there. Staying aware of who has control of the map is essential to staying alive in Valorant. His teammates end up eventually losing the round, putting the defense in a dire situation. And the reason they're in such a bad situation is their economy. Here we see the defending team only has one player able to buy a rifle and armor, and that is Sabrosa. The defense has two options here. They can either save and try to win the next two rounds, or they can full buy and hope to win this round. Both of these options are viable, and it is almost a risk management situation. If they buy and lose, they're going to be put in an unfortunate scenario. But if they force and win, they basically have the game under wraps. They actually end up full buying during this round, and let me show you why. The enemy team is also in a poor economic situation, so they can also still all buy guns. But if they lose this round, they will be in a horrible position. So basically, Sabros and his team are banking on the fact that they will win this round and break the other team's economy, a common but risky tactic. Sabrosa and his defense also go for the same defensive setup this round as they did the last. This could get risky because they need Sabrosa and the rifle to be where the enemies push in order to win this. The reason they need Sabrosa isn't necessarily because he's such a good player, but it's more so because he has this rifle. His teammates have pistols, so having this rifle on the right site is going to be crucial. Luckily, even though the enemies get a pick C, Sabrosa is instantly there. Because he is the only one on his team with a rifle, he needs to try and get at least two kills in order to make this round even possible for his team. Sabrosa did not predict this play from the attack though. The attacker sent one enemy as a distraction to C, and then took A site. This worked and put the entire defense into bad position. This bait and switch type tactic can be super useful, especially if you know the defense is in a stressful situation. Sending one player to C allowed the attackers to take A almost for free. Now they have to 3v4 retake A site. This is possible, but very difficult. By the time Sabrosa gets there, it's a 2v3 and he has to make something happen. He unluckily gets pushed by the jet and dies, and there wasn't much more Sabrosa could have done with this round. The enemy team played this nearly perfectly. They baited the defense to rotate and then took advantage of it by taking a site. Now on to round 22, a very important one, where the defense decides to buy again. Three out of the five players have rifles, but this is a questionable decision. If they buy here and lose, the game will be 11-11 and they will not be able to full buy rifles. This puts a lot of stress on the defense winning without powerful guns. Instead, it would make more sense to save here. They would likely lose the round, but it would put them in a tied game where they all have weapons. This is a decision that players have to make all the time during these close games. Sometimes taking the risk is worth it, and other times it's just not. 
Let me know what you would do if you got put in this situation down below. Now, let's see how the defense sets up. They often play very similarly to how they have been, except this time they have two players on A. They know just how difficult A will be to retake, so they decided to play two more players here to help make it a little more secure. Now, Sabrosa only has a Sheriff, so he knows he needs to hit his headshots in order to secure these kills. You can tell him this round he pays extra close attention to his crosshair placement. He plays in this weird corner that no enemy would expect, and this actually leads to him getting a kill. This is an extremely important kill though, as it was the bomb carrier. He and his team now know where the bomb is, they control the bomb, and they can play this however they want. He decides to push out and go for more kills, which nets him one, but also ends up killing him here. He just turned this round into a 5 versus 3, which is much better than a 5 versus 5. In this area, it would be smart to fall back and keep yourself alive so that the enemy isn't able to close that player gap. Instead, he pushes out and ends up dying. This was more than enough to give his team a chance, but staying alive would have been the optimal outcome for him. His teammates used the information that he gained to slowly pick off enemy players and end up in a 2v1 situation. Luckily, Sage is alive and is able to use the Revive Ultimate on Sabrosa, so he is able to help with this retake. And as soon as he's up, he immediately looks for a better gun to give him and his team the best chance in this important retake. The defense ends up winning this retake due to the kills that Sabrosa was able to get at the start of the round. This was one of those scenarios where buying ended up working even if it was very, very risky. And now, the game is one round away from over and all players have rifles and armor. This round is going to make or break this game for Sabrosa and his team. Sabrosa himself starts in garage and quickly hears a lot of action happening on C. He instantly rotates, knowing he needs to help control this site. He rotated quickly enough to grab a kill and then instantly hides. He knows that him being alive applies so much pressure to the enemies. The attackers are not going to be able to comfortably push in because Sabrosa is hiding around and pressuring them from the side. He successfully hides and peeks out to grab a second kill. He also knows now he and his team have a very good chance at winning this round, so he utilizes Phoenix's ult to pick up another two kills. All of this was possible because of his patience and ability to rotate. He reacted quickly and intelligently, staying alive. This let him get the initial kills, which gave his teammates time to help protect this bomb site. Eventually, he pushes Sova and is able to grab the ace to finish up this round and this game. Sabrosa played this round to perfection. What do you think? Would you have clutched up this game? Let us know in the comment section below. And while you're down there, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon, and like the video to get more guides that truly help you improve at Valorant every single day. We here at Skillcapped want to thank you for watching, and good luck, good half, and good game.